Okay, so now that we've looked at the intellectual foundations and background of the emerging capitalist system and sort of the foundations of liberal thought that um, justified and interpreted early capitalism, we're going to look at the first major critic of this emerging system. If Adam Smith celebrated it, Karl Marx looked at it, and even though he agreed with a lot of the things that um, sort of uh, liberal economists like Adam Smith and later David Ricardo um, saw in early capitalism, he took a much different route, as many of you probably already know, right? Marx looked at capitalism and while he admired a lot of the things about it, particularly its productive capacity, he was concerned and horrified by the growing inequality that it produced. And what we're going to do is look at first kind of the three facets of Marx and some of his key works. I'm not going to talk too much about his works. Then we'll get into sort of the background of the Communist Manifesto, its main ideas. And as I said, we'll complicate some of these ideas. Okay, so if we look at um, Karl Marx, he wrote um, a lot. He was a very... Um, a sort of prolific writer, um, dozens and dozens of and hundreds of works, uh, pamphlets, and, and everything. But for our purposes, there's sort of four key th key works that you should be aware of. One is the German Ideology, which was published in 1845. Well, he actually he wrote it in 1845, but nobody really saw it until the 1930s. Um, another one was Wage, Labor, and Capital, published in 1847. The Communist Manifesto, of course, arguably his most famous. Um, most people one that most people are at least partially familiar with, published in 1848, and Capital, volume in three volumes. Um, the first one in 1867, second one in 1885, the third one in 1894. Um, some of you know it by its German title, which is Das Kapital. Um, he really only was alive for the publication of the first volume, although he researched, we think, upwards of six volumes. Of capital. Um, the last two were published um, posthumously and mostly finished by his partner um, in uh, sort of ideology and crime, Frederick Engels, who was also um, co authored the Communist Manifesto. Now, if we go to the next slide here, there's sort of three facets of Marx. There is Marx the philosopher and historian, Marx as the theorist of capital, and Marx as a revolutionary. Now, Marx is a philosopher and the historian. Um, it's not exactly broken up like this. What I've done is I've, I've sort of uh, shown here in this slide which works go with which aspect of Marx. Now, it's not a perfect division um, for those of you that have or, and, and, or will read Marx. You notice that, well, you could make an argument that a lot of the things he says in Capital is, um, you know, Marx the historian, not just the theorist of capital, and a lot of the things he says in the Communist Manifesto, even though this is the revolutionary Marx, reflect these ideas. Of course, right? There is overlap here. But to simplify things, when we think of Marx the philosopher and the historian, at least in the sort of four key works that we've looked at here, um, really you see this in the German ideology and section eight of Capital Volume One. Now, to understand Marx the philosopher, and he articulated these ideas at least firstly in this sort of German ideology, but it, they're present throughout most of his writings, is we have to think of what his contribution was to philosophy. Now, Marx saw history as being driven by class conflict. And we'll talk more about that because it's certainly in the uh, Communist Manifesto. But it's the way that he thinks about society, right? So. Marx is a materialist. He argues and believes that society is driven and history is driven and all things that matter in history are driven by its material aspect of it. Ideas in, in, for Marx are not what drive history. It's materialism that drives history. It's not to say that ideas can't influence history. Of course they can. But what's really driving history is materialism, what he calls historical materialism, which you don't have to know too much about, but I'm just going to throw the, um, the term out there. Now, what he means by this is that if we go back to our sort of early liberal theorists, remember I said you could look at it two ways. You can look at it as these theorists are articulating a way of governing and state formation that is conducive to capitalism, sometimes consciously in the case of Adam Smith, sometimes more abstract and philosophically in the case of Hobbes, and um, in some cases, Locke, although his definition of property is pretty, even though it's abstract, is, is pretty concrete. What Marx would say was the other side of it that I argued. Did these ideas just 
create capitalism or did the emergence of capitalism allow these ideas to emerge? Now, Marx would argue that, the, that ideas emerge as the result of material change in society. And what he does is he thinks of society in two ways. And this is sort of Marx the philosopher. Um, and again, you don't have to know too much about this, but I just wanted to tease out the idea of what Marx as a philosopher um, believed. And a lot of this is articulated in the German ideology, again, published in 1840, well, originally written in 1845. It's the idea that first, materialism is what drives history, not ideas. Ideas are merely reflections of the material state of society in which they emerge. What he's more interested is the base of society, the fundamental relations of production. That is what determines everything else. So what does this mean in terms of how practically how to think about it? Marx introduces the idea of base and superstructure. Now, base or um, substructure is the base of the fundamental relations of production. So the base would be something like the relationship between a worker and his or her employer, right? Proletariat versus bourgeoisie. The state, philosophy, um, political ideology, that is superstructural, right? So it, if we can, here I'll switch the video to me here. Okay, so if we think of it this way, Right? The lighting's not very good in here, sorry. If we think of it this way, Marx is talking about it's everything down here that matters. Right, Everything up here is merely a reflection of what is down here. So politics, art, culture, philosophy, um, religion, ideas, systems of thought, they exist up here and they are merely reflections of what is going on down here. Okay, this is a lot of what Marx is getting at. So if we, again, apply this to our liberal thinkers, he would argue that Locke is merely interpreting a reality that already exists, right? If we look at, for example, the, the dispossession of indigenous peoples in the, uh, in the Americas, well, Locke is providing a perfect justification for it, right? He's saying that, well, by the definitions of productivity um, in England at the time, they saw indigenous peoples in the Americas as fundamentally unproductive. So Locke creates this justification that makes people feel better about violently dispossessing a group of people from their land. This is his idea of property. This is how the English defined property. This is what he means. Um, how ideas emerge from a state that already exists, right? Colonists were already trying to dispossess and had been for hundreds of years, um, indigenous peoples from their property, whether it be the English, but before that, the Portuguese and the Spanish, right? He's merely creating a justification for it. So he does not invent the idea. He merely justifies a state that already exists. This is a lot of what, what Marx is getting at. So if you think of modern society, he would argue, if we look at Canada, our government, our um, institutions, um, education, all of that is superstructural and merely reflect what's going on at sort of the base substructure of society. This is Marx the philosopher. And again, a lot of that you can find in the German ideology. Now, Marx the historian is also connected to this, and I mentioned this earlier. It's the way he understands how history unfolds. He sees history as being driven by class conflict and class antagonism. This is distinct from liberal thought. Under liberal thought, people like Hobbes, Locke, and Smith, and many others see, specifically Smith, that society is driven by markets and the expansion of markets. Marx would say, no, 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 society, or history rather, is driven by class conflict. So if we go back to our first lecture when we talk about the transition from feudalism to capitalism, somebody like Smith would look more at the rise of towns and cities and the role that they played in the expansion of the marketplace as the driving factor. Karl Marx would say, no, 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 no. It's actually those peasant revolts. That's key, right? Yes, the demographic thing is a problem, but those, that class conflict between peasant and lord, that is fundamentally what was driving the transition, right? So again, it gets back to this sort of prime mover. A Marx or a Marxist would argue it's class conflict. A liberal economist like Adam Smith would argue, no, it's the expansion of markets. That's how Marx sees history. He also sees history as funk operating in various epochs. You have a kind of agrarian 
primitive state similar to the state of nature that uh, Hobbes describes, but he doesn't see it quite as violent, where very little is actually being able to produce. Then he sees sort of feudalism as another sort of epoch. Capitalism, even though he's a critic of capitalism, he sees as a necessary phase on the road to what he argues will come next, which is socialism. So this is Marx the philosopher. Now Marx the theorist of capital um, can be found specifically in the work Wage, Labor, and Capital, and all volumes of Capital, um, Das Kapital. And a lot of what Marx, I mean, there's, there's many things that he argues, and I'm not going to get too much into it because we don't have that much time. I mean, you could do an entire class on Capital Volume 1, or you could do an entire class on one chapter in Das Kapital. So I'll just go over it very quickly. One of the key things to understand about Marx as a theorist of capital is his idea of what is called the labor theory of value. Now, this is very abstract. I'm going to try to put it in the most simplest terms. What he means is he's, he's defining value, right? Most of us think of value in the context of price, right? An iPhone, an iPad, right? It has a price and therefore it has value. The way Marx defines value is a little bit different. He defines value in terms of labor time. So how much this iPhone is worth is not so much according to Marx based on supply and demand. That's a little bit different. According to Marx, it's how much labor time went into building it and it breaks down in many ways. So if we look at this, what we're talking about is, okay, how much did you have to pay somebody and how many people were paid to make the screen? How many people were paid to make the tools that you had to use to make the screen? How, many, how, mu how much money did it cost to abstract the raw materials that go into making the screen? And then if we go all the way down the assembly line, how much did it cost to actually put the thing together? How much did it cost to ship it? Who was getting paid? So the value of a particular commodity in the context of Marx is how much labor time went into producing that particular commodity. And we can use a simpler one. If we look at shoes from Lynn, Massachusetts, it would go like this. Okay, If we're talking about a capitalistic mode of production, right? if we talk about the merchants of Lynn that took control of production, then what we're talking about here is, okay, who made the leather? Right, The amount of labor time that went into making that leather Okay, then the amount of labor time that goes into attaching the leather to the sole of the shoe, the amount of labor time that goes into polishing the leather, the amount of labor time that goes into finishing the shoe, the amount of labor time and cost to transport the shoe to whichever market it's getting to. That's how value is determined. And you can kind of understand then how if you think of value as emerging from labor time, where real value in society, if you follow the works of Marx, actually lies, right? in the individual workers themselves, not the capitalists who own the means of production. Right? So this is Marx as theory, as a theorist of capital. And he was also criticizing the sort of increasing commodification of labor. Right? The idea that people had to sell themselves or sell their labor time in order to live. And he also gets at this idea of alienation. Right? And what he means by alienation, and some of you may be familiar with this already, is this idea if we go back to the artisanal mode of production and our master craftsman, the master craftsman is not so much alienated from his labor, right? He may be selling it to somebody, the particular shoe that he produces, but he controls all aspects of production, he can make it for himself, and he is in control of everything. Under a capitalist mode of production, especially in a factory system, Marx would argue that all workers are alienated from their labor because everything they're working has nothing to do with them, right? The shoe that they're building or the, the cotton that they're spinning is going to somebody else, right? All they're getting in exchange is a wage in that context. This is sort of what he means by alienation and exploitation. And then finally, there's Marx the revolutionary. Now, a lot of what Marx the revolutionary is, is he takes all his ideas as a philosopher and a historian or a theorist of capital, and he puts it into practice. And this is a lot of what the Communist Manifesto is. It's a distillation of a lot of the things that he thinks summed up in 30 pages, right? If you, those of you that read the Communist Manifesto, he has a theory of history in the Communist Manifesto, he has a theory of labor value in the Communist Manifesto, and he also has a theory of class in the Communist Manifesto. Right? So this is Marx the revolutionary. He's taking all these ideas and he's putting it into practice. All right, so that's sort of the introduction to Marx that I wanted to give. And now I'll stop it there and we'll look at 
um, the Communist Manifesto, the background to the Communist Manifesto, but also the main ideas of the Communist Manifesto.